dance. Yeah, let's worship him.
giving all of our time, bowing down and worshiping these other things in our life. And those aren't bad. It's okay to have entertainment. But what do you worship? So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and see different examples of worship and wrong responses to who God is. If you look in Exodus 20, verses 2 through 6, this is the Ten Commandments. In verse 2 it says, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. So you see there in the very first two commandments, if you state those in the affirmative and the positive, the first two commandments are worship me and worship only me. So I'd say worship is a pretty big thing to God. Why? Because worship is the most powerful ascription of worth that we can give to anything. You cannot ascribe any greater value to something than to worship it. Worship is our best. God demands our best. God deserves our best. If you're taking notes, write that down, right? God deserves our best. We're going to go through that for a second. God deserves our best. First of all, God deserves our best. Only God. Look at verse 3 there again. It says, you must not have any other God but me. Why would he say that? Except for the assumption that likely other things would try and come in and take over as God in our lives. That they would try and take our attention, our worship away from God. God deserves our best, nothing else. And then this God deserves our best. 1 Peter 2.24 says that it was on Him whom all of our sins were laid. That he paid the price for our sins. Nobody else. Duck Dynasty didn't pay the price for my sins. The Buffalo Bills didn't pay the price for my sins. God deserves our best. He earned it. And then this, God deserves our best. Christians, it's our job to worship God. It's our privilege to worship God. Turn to Psalm 96 with me. Something that I thought about with this verse here was the President of the United States, and I'll show you here why. Psalm 96, verse 9. I'll give you a second to get there. Psalm 96, verse 9. God deserves our best. In Psalm 96, 9, it says, Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. Now I thought about that as I was reading it, and it kind of hit me this way. Perhaps the second line in that verse is a result of the first line in that verse. <coughs> first line, worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Okay. If you do that, all the earth will tremble before him. And I kind of started to think about, think about the President of the United States. Whether you like him or not, if he walked in the door right now, I'd probably get a little nervous, you know? Like a little starstruck, like, holy crap, there he is, the president's in the building. Why is that, though? It's because we create this, this big deal about the president. You know, he's, he's got the beast, the, the rocket-proof automobile, the to this huge motorcade anytime he takes a step. Helicopters, I just saw a thing the other day, they're in like a $4 billion contract for nine new helicopters for the president. How many can you ride in at once? <laughs> but we create this huge deal about the President of the United States. He's just one dude. But if you walked in the door, whether you like him or not, probably get a little starstruck, right? And we do that with a, a ton of celebrities. Why do we get starstruck? Because we get we create this big deal about him. And so you see here in verse 9, Psalm 96, 
Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. So that if God walks in the door, holy crap, God's here. <laughs> right? <laughs> Imagine his motorcade coming through. Like, except he doesn't need rocket-proof vehicles. He doesn't need nine helicopters. But isn't that what it should be like every time the church gathers? Amen. That every time an unbeliever walks through that door, they can say, holy crap, God is here. <laughs> right? Because his people are worshiping him giving him everything they've got. God deserves our best. Yeah. And then finally, God deserves our best. Again, our best. The best that we can give anything. The, the greatest value we can ascribe to anything is to worship it. God deserves our worship. So I was thinking about that as I was studying it. The problem is, is that the term best suggests that there should be some way to study God, worship God. How do we worship God? What does it mean to give God our best? And then I found it, of course, in God's Word. Turn to John chapter 4. What does it mean to worship God your best? How do you, is there a proper way to, to worship God? In John chapter 4, Jesus is, is traveling and he, he comes up to this well and there's, there's a Samaritan woman sitting at the well. Now just for a little bit of backstory, it was basically the Samaritans and then the Jews, right? The, the Baptists and then the Presbyterians. You got to do your thing, we'll do our thing, don't bother us. Don't dare communicate, nothing, right? That's what Moses is trying to break here with gathering all the, the pastors around us from all these different churches, the Catholic Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist Church. But why, what are we playing for different teams? So we're bringing all these churches together and Jesus comes to the Samaritan woman and he says, can you give me a drink? And she's blown away by this. The Presbyterian speaking to the Baptist, she's thinking, uh, what are you, you're talking to me? Like, Jews don't speak to Samaritans. So she takes the opportunity, basically. In John chapter 4, verse 19, she says, Okay, well, since you're going to talk to me, uh, I got a question for you. Sir, the woman said, verse 19, You must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Watch what Jesus says. Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. You get it now? We can move on? I didn't. <laughs> like, okay, that sounds great, but I still don't get it. <laughs> so I went back and read it again and again. What I started to see was that He's talking about the, the Samaritans and their way of worshiping God. The lady, again, she asks, how come we claim we worship God this way, you claim you worship God this way, and we both think we had it right, right? <laughs> Any churches on that page? We've got the only way, and so does every other church on the block that has a different way. But if you read in verse 22, it says, you Samaritans know very little about the one that you worship. So what I saw there was all spirit, no truth. You're worshiping God. You're, you're going, you're super excited, great beat, fist pumping. Church is awesome. We're having a blast. Who are we worshiping again? All spirit, no truth. Verse 22, again, he says, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. While we Jews, we know all about him. 
Moses, how exciting was Temple ever? Right. <laughs> All truth, no spirit. We've got our rituals, we do this, and then this, and then this, and then this. Don't you dare smile, this is church. <laughs> all truth, no spirit. Samaritans, all spirit, I have no idea what we're worshiping. No truth. But if you look down at verse 23, Jesus says, But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and and in truth, both at the same time. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. How do we worship God our best? In spirit and in truth. What does that mean? It means acknowledging the truth of God's Word. Know who you're worshiping. Don't just come to church and worship because everybody else around you is worshiping. It's just the thing to do. You know, everybody else is in the building is doing it, so I guess I'll join in. Have a clue as to who you're worshiping. But don't be all truth and no spirit. You see, the truth should produce joy. That's one of the fruits of the spirit, right? I read an article, and it was a little it was a five-year-old boy that was, he was in like the front pew of the church, and He's turned around smiling at the people behind him and having a good time. And his mom is like as stern as could be. Sit down. Stop smiling. Don't you know we're in church? Like, really? <laughs> Zero fun in church. And that was really for most of my time growing up. We grew up in a church where we knew the rituals. We knew when to stand up, sit down, bow, kneel, do jumping jacks, roll around. But there's no smiling, no happiness. All truth. No spirit. So know who you're worshiping. And let the knowledge of who you're worshiping, the truth of God's word, lead to that joy, that spirit. If you feel him tugging on your heart, to lift your hands and praise him, to lift your voice louder and sing to him. Follow. Let that happen. Don't stifle that spirit. You'll see the result of somebody who stifled that spirit a little bit later here. See, what I realized as I was studying this is that God has a love language. How many here have heard of the love languages? Right? Moses, do you remember who wrote that book? Gary Chapman. Gary Chapman. If you don't know the, the premise of the love languages, it basically goes like this. Uh, each person has a love language. A way in which they feel loved. And naturally, the way in which they feel loved will also be the way that they tend to show love. So, for example, Jamie's love language is words. She feels loved by words of affection and, and words of affirmation. So, she would naturally tend to show love that way as well. To give words of affirmation, give words of affection. But there's a problem. That's not my love language. My love language is time, spending time together. So I'm spending all this time with Jamie, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is, it's going great. She knows I love her, everything's great, she has no clue that I love her, right? Because why? I'm not speaking her love language. So the key is to don't get so buried down in your own love language. Really, your love language doesn't matter in terms of loving the people around you. you got to be speaking their languages. I'll give you these five love languages, and if you don't know that of your spouse yet, find out when you get home. The first is gifts. Many people feel loved by the language of gifts, by just bringing home roses or uh, just some simple gift, a card, whatever it is. That's the first of the five love languages. And really, you should be able to pick these out about the people around you all the time. You should know how the people that you interact with, how they feel loved, so that you can do your job and love on those people around you. So the first is gifts. The second is acts of service. Maybe she just feels loved if I'm mowing the yard or, or cleaning the house, whatever it is. That's not the case. She doesn't care. <laughs> she can care less. So I could be out there mowing the yard, painting the house, 
putting new shingles on the roof. Man, this is awesome. She's going to be so proud of me. And she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Acts of service is the second love language. The third is words. Words of affirmation and words of affection. Uh, encouragement. Building somebody up by words. The fourth is time. Just flat out being together. Spending time together. Doesn't matter what you're doing, if you're sitting at Starbucks, studying together, even if you're not talking or interacting, you're, you're spending time together. That's mine. And the fifth is touch. It's a holding hands, putting your arm around each other, or whatever it is. So those are the five love languages amongst people. But what's God's love language? Worship. Worship in spirit and in truth. And just like if, if I'm speaking my love language to Jamie, if I'm giving her time, but hers is words, she's got no idea that I love her. And just like if I'm speaking my love language to God, and I, I refuse to get on his track, on his love language, worshiping in spirit and in truth, perhaps I'm not worshiping at all. Perhaps he has no idea that I'm worshiping him or that I want to worship him. This is God's love language. Worship in spirit and in truth. See, authentic worship is the right response to an accurate understanding of who God is. That's the spirit. The right response to who God is, the spirit of God. Remember the verse says, God is spirit. And the truth, the right response to what he has done, as we read in his word, what he is doing, what we see him doing in our own lives, and what we know that he will do, as is prophesied in his word. Worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Speaking God's love language, not your own. Not, oh, I, sorry, I don't, I don't do the singing thing, that's not my love. I, I don't do that, right? You see, it's possible to have a right understanding of who God is and to respond incorrectly. It's possible to know Jamie's love language and say, Pat, words, no, that, that's uncomfortable, I don't like that, I'm going to stick over here on my time thing, right? And she'll get it eventually. God will know eventually, right? No. He's got his love language. And so we see that it's possible to have a right understanding of who God is and yet respond incorrectly. Turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4 with me. We're going to look at seven incorrect responses to who God is. Seven incorrect responses to the presence of God. Incorrect ways of worshiping God. First Samuel chapter four. I guess I better turn there a little. First Samuel chapter four, verse one. Now a little bit of a backstory on this. Um, the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was built in order to represent God. When the Ark of the Covenant was coming through, that was like the president coming through town. You worshipped. In fact, they had coverings over this thing so that you couldn't look at it. The only person that was able to, or allowed to look at this was the high priest. The Ark of the Covenant was the presence of God. And so, if we read 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, we'll see how the Israelites responded to this presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 1. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Aphek. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they said, Ooh, I got an idea. Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. 
And so we see, first off, how the Israelites are treating the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God Almighty, the creator of the universe. This Ark of the Covenant, which was to represent God's presence, the Israelites, how are they treating it? Like a good luck charm. Maybe if I go to church, I'll get God on my good side, and then he'll overcome my problems for me. That's just a good luck charm, right? No, look what happens. They were defeated because of it. God's not just a good luck charm. We don't use worship as an attempt to get God on our good side so that he'll overcome our problems. That's a flippant attitude towards who God is. And then we'll see the Philistines. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Go there with me. So basically the Philistines, they came to this Israelite camp. The Israelites who had the Ark of the Covenant with them and thought that because they had it with them, they would be protected and that it would be their good luck charm and help them to overcome and, and win this battle. Uh, didn't work so well. Defeated. If God's your good luck charm, it's not going to work out so well. So the Philistines defeat them. They take this Ark of the Covenant, this presence of God, they take it and put it on a shelf next to their God. Let's read in 1 Samuel 5, chapters 1 through 4. It says, After the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they took it from the battleground of Ebenezer to the town of Ashdod. They carried the Ark of God into the temple of Dagon and placed it beside an idol of Dagon. But when the citizens of Ashdod went to see it the next morning, Dagon had fallen with his face to the ground in front of the Ark of the Lord. Remember our definition of worship. So they took Dagon and put him in his place again. But the next morning, the same thing happened. Dagon had fallen face down before the Ark of the Lord again. This time, his head and hands had broken off and were lying in the doorway. Only the trunk of his body was left intact. So you see that the Philistines, they, they captured this Ark of the Covenant. And I, I got it. I think I'll go to church now, maybe. And just put God on the shelf as another one of my gods. Right? That's all the Philistines did here. I'll put... That thing is sweet. Put it up there on the shelf next to our other God. Maybe that'll help with our collection. Got my life in order. I got things going pretty well. Uh, I think I'll go to church, too. That'll be a good addition to my life and collecting my life. And God can just be another God in my life. Got Duck Dynasty on Tuesday. I got the Buffalo Bills on Sunday. God on Saturday night or Sunday morning. Just my list of gods. I've got my life in pretty good order, right? No. God is not just another God that you put on a shelf with all the rest of your gods. And we'll see here that the Philistines, because they tried to do this, not so great. Not a great result. And if we do the same thing, if we try and put God on the shelf with all of our other gods, it's not going to be so comfortable. God's not just another God. Let's go to verse 6. Then the Lord's heavy hand struck the people of Ashdod and the nearby villages with a plague of tumors. When the people realized what was happening, they cried out, We can't keep the ark of the God of Israel here any longer. He is against us. We will all be destroyed along with Dagon, our God. So they called together the rulers of the Philistine towns and asked, What should we do with the ark of the God of Israel? The rulers discussed it and replied, Move it to the town of Gath. <laughs> I love that. This thing's killing us. Send it to Tiberias. Get it out of here. <laughs> Maybe they'll do better with it. So they moved the ark of the God of Israel to Gath. But when the ark arrived at Gath, the Lord's heavy hand fell on his men. Young and old, he struck them with the plague of tumors, and there was a great panic. So they sent the ark of the God to the town of Ekron. Let's try Leesburg. But when the people of Ekron saw it coming, they cried out. They're bringing the ark of the God of Israel here to kill us too. The people summoned the Philistine rulers again and begged them, Please send the ark of the God of Israel back to its own country, or it will kill us all. For the deadly plague from God had already begun, and great fear was sweeping across the town. Those who didn't die were afflicted with tumors, and the cry from the town rose to heaven. You know what I see here? The presence of God inflicting change in the world. And these people who are just trying to put God on the shelf, 
and then finding out the hard way, God's just not another God on the shelf next to your other ones. He's the God of the universe, and when you find that out the hard way, it's not going to be pleasant. God is the God, the only God. Your gods will worship the God. It's not to be just put on a shelf. And what you see here is that the presence of God, imagine literally our church setting up camp here, and people start to get healed, and people start to come to our church, and, and he's changing his community, but the community on the outside, they don't like it. Get that church out of our town. Send it over to Tavares. So we go over to Tavares, and the same thing happens. Send it out to Leesburg. It's exactly what the Philistines are doing here. Saying maybe, maybe this God, maybe if we put this on our shelf, then it'll it'll add to my collection. I've got my car, I've got the wife, the kids, the house, everything. I'll add a little bit of God to that shelf, and then maybe my life will be happy and pleasant. But we find out that's not true when the real God of the universe shows you who he really is. Then we see the people of Beth Shemesh. Why don't you guys all say that with me? Say that once, Beth Shemesh. Okay, now you know how it feels. So you can't make fun of me for sure. So the people of Beth Shemesh, they are in fact Israelites. And the, the Philistines, they get tired of this thing just destroying their people, killing their people, bringing plagues on their people. Get the church out of here, we don't want it anymore. So they send this Ark of the Covenant back to the Israelite town, and it comes strolling into town on, on a cart on top of two cows. Now, I don't know if I went into it before, but this Ark of the Covenant, it was designed to be carried on poles so that you wouldn't touch this thing. You couldn't touch it. It was the presence of God. Just like you cannot look into the eyes of God, you couldn't touch this thing. And so this thing comes, it comes rolling into town on top of two cows on a cart, and the people of Beth Shemesh, the, the, the Israelites, they're stoked. They realize, yes, the, the presence of God is coming back into our town. But we'll see here that they're victim of the all spirit, no truth language. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13. It says, the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley, and when they saw the ark, they were overjoyed. The cart came into the field of a man named Joshua and stopped beside a large rock. So the people broke up the wood of the cart for fire and killed the cows and sacrificed them to the Lord as a burnt offering. Several men of the tribe of Levi lifted the ark of the Lord in the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors from the cart and placed them on a large rock. Many sacrifices and burnt offerings were offered to the Lord that day by the people of Beth Shemesh. The five Philistine rulers watched all this and then returned to Ekron that same day. Now I like that, that last line there right there. The five Philistine rulers, the non-Israelites, the, the unbelievers, the not-church, they watched this whole thing happening. They're seeing this, this worship ceremony, the people worshiping God. That's a good thing. But watch what happens. Verse 19 it says, But the Lord killed 70 men from Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. And the people mourned greatly because of what the Lord had done. Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? They cried out. Where can we send the ark from here? And so we see the people of Beth Shemesh, all spirit, super excited about this thing rolling into town. No truth. No idea how to handle this Ark of the Covenant. Therefore, looking into it, that was clearly identified in, the, in their rules. You don't look into the Ark of the Covenant. You don't even touch the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, it was covered with cloth as it traveled so that you couldn't even look at it, much less, much less in it. So the people of Beshemesh, all spirit, no truth. You see people that come in and you know, we put on the worship show. Right? We're excited, we're lifting our hands, we're praising, but we have no idea who we're worshiping. I'm pretty good at doing this with football. 
if I go to somebody's house and let's say they're a, a Buffalo Bills fan, for that nine hour football game, I'm the biggest Buffalo Bills fan in the world because my buddy's a Buffalo Bills fan. And I'm hooting, hollering, and celebrating every time they score a touchdown, but by the time the game is over, it's like, well, what were we doing again? How can we just spend nine hours of our day on this football game? And that's what the people of Best Mesh are doing. They're worshiping all spirit, no truth. Super excited, no idea why. And then you see their response to this, this flippant attitude towards God. I'll, I'll worship him, I'll get excited, I'll put on a worship show, but don't try and teach me anything about God and who he is. So look at their response in verse 20. Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? You see, they found out who God really is. And they said, get him out of here. We, we can't deal with that. It's not flowing so easily. Worshiping God until stuff goes wrong, and then sending him away. Saying, oh, I tried the Christian thing. I tried the God thing. I tried going to church, and I, I, I raised my hands, and I worshiped. But as soon as I found out who God was, mm, oh, thanks. On to the next thing. And then we see Abinadab, the next guy, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. So, so the men of kiriath Jerem came to get the ark of the Lord. They took it to the hillside home of Abinadab and ordained Eleazar, his son, to be in charge of it. The ark remained in kiriath Jerem for a long time, 20 years in all. I want to stop there. This ark of the covenant remained in Abinadab's house for 20 years. And how many of us have just gone to church just repeatedly, 20 years. I was raised in the church. This is just what I do. We go to church on Sundays. That's what we do, right? Look at the last line there in verse 2. During that time, all Israel mourned because it seemed the Lord had abandoned them. What? He's on, he's on the shelf in your house, literally. He's in Abinadab's house. How has he abandoned you? Perhaps you're not really worshiping him. Perhaps he's just another piece of furniture in the house. Perhaps we're just coming to church, just going through the motions. It's just another item on the agenda for the week. How come God's not working in my life? I don't get it. I go to church every week. Just another piece of furniture. Oh, you mean you actually want me to read my Bible to actually get something out of this going to church thing? No thanks. I don't participate. I just go to church. Perhaps God is just another item on your agenda for the week. So that's not going to turn out so great. 20 years he spent with the Ark of the Covenant in his house. 20 years people spent in church not, never seeing the work of God in their lives. Because they're not really worshiping God. It's just another item on their agenda. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. See the next response, a man named Uzzah. Now Uzzah was actually the son of Abinadab. Who remember, this thing was just another piece of furniture in the house for 20 years. Just another nice box in the corner. No big deal, that's just, my, that's just God over there. No big thing. So Uzzah, in 2 Samuel 6, verses 2 to 6, says he led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio, Abinadab's sons, were guiding the cart as it left the house, carrying the ark of God. Ahio walked in front of the ark. David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments. Lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. Now, one thing I want to recognize first before we do this, uh, Uzzah is the son of Abinadab, which, as we just said, Abinadab had the presence of God in his house for 20 years, and they're wondering why God has abandoned him. So just another piece of furniture on the shelf, right? But he's also a resident of Beth Shemesh. 
all spirit, no truth. Super excited about this Ark of the Covenant thing, but no idea how to handle it. And so you see what they did. They placed it on another cart, just like the Philistines had done. The people, they're not even Israelites. The Philistines, they, they weren't responsible for knowing how to handle this thing. But the people of Beth Shemesh, Abinadab, Uzzah, they should have known how to handle this thing. How to recognize the presence of God. How to treat the presence of God. But they didn't. They just threw it on another cart and sent it into the next town. So Uzzah is just a product of the previous two. Just another piece of furniture. All spirit, no truth. Here's the problem. Uzzah, you're still responsible for your own understanding and therefore worship. We cannot live our, our, our worship life, our, our response to God vicariously through our parents. And just because I've gone to church for 20 years, I think I know how to, how to worship God or how to revere God. No, it doesn't work that way. You're responsible for your own response to who God is. So look in verse 6. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nahon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. Just another piece of furniture. No idea how to handle this thing. Overly familiar with the utterly sacred. It's just church. We're just worshiping God. No big deal. Two more, three more, sorry. David, his response to what has just happened to Uzzah, flip the page over to 2 Samuel 6, verses 8 through 10. It says, David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah. Jump down to verse 9. David was now afraid of the Lord, and he asked, how can I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? So David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it into the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. You see, David was scared to death of what had just happened to this Uzzah guy, so don't bring that thing to my house. <laughs> Get it out of here. David, afraid of what he doesn't understand. And I saw this in my own walk as I started to grow in Christ and my understanding started to advance and I, there were things that I still didn't understand. How come God doesn't do, my, do things my way? So I began to, to fear God and maybe I don't like this whole God thing, right? And as we grow further in our walk with Christ, as we draw nearer to Him, here's the problem, the enemy chases even harder. It starts to bring in doubts and fears, and maybe I don't like this whole God thing. Maybe I don't like this, this Christianity thing. It's not so easy. It's not always so fun. See, David didn't understand why God killed Uzzah, so David said, get that thing away from me. Get that God thing away from me. Afraid to draw near to God for fear he might do something that David wouldn't understand. So send it over to obed -Edom's house. 2 Samuel 11, or chapter 6, verses 11 to 15. It says, The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. Then King David was told, The Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with a great celebration. So David's like, okay, I didn't kill him. Now you can bring it to my house. Looks like the coast is clear. Bring it on. Now we'll see Michael's response. The person who's too cool, too proud to worship. 2 Samuel 6, verse 16. Well, let me go up and read uh, 14. It says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of ram's horns. So David, now finally welcoming God into, into his house, 
is ecstatic. He's going crazy. He's dancing. He's worshiping. He's, he looks like a fool, honestly. But that's okay. And watch what Michael, David's wife, says. Verse 16. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, David's wife, looked down from her window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt. Now, Michael, first off, why aren't you down there worshiping with them? You're just as much a part of the church. How come you're standing over there in the corner? Look at all these old people worshiping around you. Why are they singing so loud? Why do they look so happy? Why are their hands in the air? I don't do that. I, I'm too proud, too cool. I'm not humbling myself before God. All truth, no spirit. Proud spectators watching all the other people worship, watching all the other people respond to God's presence. And then we say, and I've said this myself before, well, God knows my heart. And I finally figured out, yeah, that's the scary part. <laughs> that's the dangerous part. God knows my heart. And that the lack of, of joy in who God is is the reason that I sit here too proud to worship, too scared I feel him leading me to truly worship in spirit and truth, but afraid to step out there and do it. And then finally we see Obed-Edom, who's delighted regardless of what just happened. He says, yeah, I, I understand you killed Uzzah, not real sure why, but bring it on. Bring that thing to my house. In verses uh, 10 to 12, jumping back up. So David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. The right response to God. Even if I don't fully understand all the time, that's okay. I know how to treat the presence of God and bring it into my house. I'm all for it. And because of it, Obed-Edom is blessed for those three months. I don't care what anyone thinks, or I don't care that I don't always understand. I'm all in. I don't know it all, but I know who God is and how he is to be worshipped, so bring him on. Now these are the seven wrong responses and the one right response. And I've seen myself walk through each and every one of these. I was raised in the church. We just went to church. That's what we did. You know, it was our weekly thing. I was a kid, no idea what's going on. I was just excited for the donuts. That was what church was good for on Sundays, right? And I've had God as a good luck charm. Starting to kind of get, okay, maybe this God thing is real. Maybe I'll go to church and I'll try and get him on my good side. And then things will start going my way. God's just a good love charm. No, he's not. And I started to find out the truth of who he is. I said, okay, maybe God's not so much of a good love charm. And I've done the all spirit, no truth thing. The, the worshiping, getting into it just because everybody around me is doing it, but no idea who I'm worshiping. No idea why I'm worshiping. What are we doing again? Where are we? And then I've done the all truth, no spirit thing. The church that I was raised in was... All truth, no spirit. Don't smile, it's church. Just remember your rituals, remember when to say, and also with you. And peace be with me. And I thought of these other possible hindrances of worship in closing fear, worry, illness, anger, exhaustion. There's been plenty of times where I come in here to lead worship and not filled with fear of what's going to go on this next week at work or filled with worry about, I hope this goes right. I hope you remember the breakdown in this part of the song or feel even sick sometimes. I think two Sundays ago it was that I sat in the car and I was like, well, I don't think we can worship today. I got to go home. I'm sick. And they basically pulled me out of the car, carried me in here. They prayed for me, and we worshiped that morning. And the anger. Sometimes life's just tough, and you're angry at God. I've totally been angry at God before, and I don't want to worship. Or exhaustion, just beat down. Exhausted by life. I'm just going to come in here to the church and just go through it, and no big deal. But I remember fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, we're not given a spirit.
spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And so there the truth of God has, has excused my hindrance to worship and brought me to a place where I can worship. Or worry. I remember Philippians 4, 6. Worry about nothing, pray about everything. Or Matthew 6, 25. Don't worry about anything. Who can add a minute to his life by worrying? Or illness. And I remember the one of the names of God is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. Our anger. And I remember Ephesians 4, 26. Do not let your anger lead to sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. Or exhaustion. Matthew 11, 28. Christ says, come to me, all who are weary and weak, and I will give you rest. And so there, each of my excuses for why I can't worship today, my anger, my illness, my worry, my fear, my exhaustion, they've all been overcome by the truth of God's word, and I can get back on track and worship God because of those things, because he overcomes my fear and my worry. So we don't have any more excuses anymore for not responding to the presence of God for who he really is, for how he deserves to be worshipped. We know how to worship God in spirit and in truth. We know the way that God wants to be worshipped. Know who he is. And because of that knowing of who he is, that produces that spirit of joy, spirit and truth worshiping God. Worship is the greatest value you can ascribe to anything. And God is the only one deserving of your worship. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your sovereignty, Lord, for the fact that you never change. Lord, life seems to constantly be changing on us, constantly throwing us different curveballs different things to hinder us from worshiping you, from focusing on you, Lord. Lord, you never change. And even with all of those hindrances to worship, Lord, you still extend grace to us. You're always there to say, it's okay, try it again. Get your mind back on worship. You're always there, Lord. Never changing always receiving of our worship, Lord. But we pray that you would just fill our hearts to worship you, not just when we come to church and sing three or four songs, Lord, but that we would worship you in our jobs in every moment of our lives, Lord. That that would add purpose and value to our jobs, to our life at home, to everything, Lord, because it's in worship of you that we do those things. Lord, we just pray that you would let this message, let your word sink into our hearts, Lord, so that we can have a right response to who you are. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could have the guys pass